I mean, usually the, I've, I've found that the best managements don't really talk about the share price at all, mm -hmm. unless obviously things are stupidly st cheap and they're allocating capital and doing buybacks, but it tends to be about why they're, how they're doing operating the business and the share price is a secondary consideration to some degree. <laughs> So I'm here on Zeros with uh, Jules Hull of Stockviews, a UK-based independent research house. Jules, thank you very much for coming on today. Really great to have you on the show. Yeah, hi Freddie. Honoured, honoured to be um, be included in uh, in some of the stuff you guys are doing. Obviously, we've always been big admirers. So yeah, looking forward to chatting. Yeah, to kick things off. You know, I've followed. Your, uh, your work for a number of years, um, you know, both when you were putting out sort of more traditional um, pieces and kind of the independent sell side equity research frame, but also, you know, the more modern approach you've taken with a quantitative view. But really, I'm interested in, you know, how you got here, um, you know, in terms of your career and, and where you started uh, in the investment business? Well, I um, originally, I, I was about to do law and I was all set to, to do a um, training contract at one of the, the sort of city law firms. And I had a day in the floor of Bear Stearns. Mm -hmm. I think it was the first day of the real beginning of the crash. Yeah, it must have been August 20, uh, sorry, 2007. And I think some hedge fund had just blown up or so there was anyway there was the beginning sort of palpitations the market was down about three or four percent i think on the day i mean I, I barely knew what an equity was at the time but it was um having been done a training contract and sort of you know been in a, a legal world where missing a full stop mattered more than any you know mattered more than your life the dynamism of of the equity trading floor at bear stearns while things were melting down was really quite exciting so that sort of made me rapidly change course. I cancelled my, my law school fees and yeah, and then very quickly sort of set about trying to get into the into the equity world. And about a few months later, I had started at what was then really quite a small, young, aspiring firm called Redburn, which was a research only firm. And I guess it's, I don't know, maybe it's my personality or whatever, but I mean, I was at Redburn for, for 10 years or so. And back then it was a sort of, not a startup per se, but it was trying to do things a bit differently and take a purist approach to, to research. And I was there and, and learned under some great, great people. Um, and there was a real sort of, you know, stock picking mentality um at the core of, of what they were doing to begin with and um that was really exciting and and sort of taught learned my craft there things progressed the industry progressed somewhat and i sort of came came across and got in touch with stock views and tom who's who's one of the co-founders and and what they were trying to do just sounded so interesting and and compelling at the time that and also mifid was just about to sort of kick in and and it was you know they were trying to think about the real value of, of where fund managers would look in terms of trying to find alpha and trying to be really focused with your research instead of just having this waterfront coverage, which is what mm -hmm. everything had become. When you were at Redburn, you guys were employing the, um, you know, the kind of impartial sell-side equity research. You weren't backed by a bank. Yeah, it no, was so the banking business. The, the entire exactly, model was, was commission-driven. It was the big independent at the time. I think the model has is, is, is moved on a little bit from here, but the yeah, there was it was purely a, a research based business, which it gave it both a, a purity of approach, which which the clients liked, but then in the world of Mifid, as research, you know, um, revenue started to be cut and cut and cut, and the spend that people were allocating was under intense scrutiny that became a bit of a problem, I think, and and also you suddenly had the corporate advisory take off um and this is something that we've we've tracked a bit so in the in the the incentive world and in the sell side and, and the analysts you know you had something like back in you know early 2010s probably 50 percent of of revenue was coming from equity research and, and trading 
Whereas now across the, the especially in the UK, amongst the UK players and the UK mid-cap players, it's it's probably now only five five percent of, of revenues come from um, from the pure equity slug. Trying to do that pure equity analysis and why you're doing it has become totally warped because ultimately what most of the revenue that, that pays for your bills, if you're an analyst, any normal sell side institution is is around corporate advisory and brokerage and other things. But yeah, no, Redburn was was purely independent. Um, and what attracted me to, to stop using what where you know what we're doing and have always tried to do is have this very pure philosophy of of just being a sort of fee driven you know, from, you know, very simple top line, you know, rev- revenue, a you know, subscription fee model, basically, um, that clients pay for. I want to talk a little bit about your approach as an analyst. Did you have a sector coverage? Um, how would you find new stocks to cover? What was your diligence process before you picked up coverage? Um, how did that all work? So I was on the sales desk at Redburn, which was always very idea driven and uniquely close to the analysts in terms of idea generation and, and discussion. And I think that was one of the great things that, that really worked for it during that time is there was quite a lot of interaction and thought around how new ideas were, were generated and what, what, you know, what they would be looked at. Ultimately, because of the way the the fee structure worked and clients worked, you would tend to want to cover larger companies because you had a trading arm alongside you as well. Um, mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that that again was very attractive and is exciting about the world of going slightly lower down the market cap scale and focusing in the mid cap, which is what we do now, is that there's a paucity of research there and it's a growing paucity and it's badly incentivized and skewed. Um, And so you have a situation where there's just less people looking at these companies in the way that, that you'd want to be sort of analyzing them. And that that's, that's sort of the opportunity because it's, yeah, it's just not particularly, you know, if you're, if you're a large brokerage firm or you're, you're a sell side analyst, ultimately you want, large clients to be able to trade your stock otherwise you won't get voted you won't get points you can't you know the corporate advisory the the whole thing sort of compounds itself so um and in a mythid world that's become even more extreme i think so we talked about uh the time you spent or uh, i think it was a day you spent on the trading floor at bear stones watching the world fall apart beyond that how much time did you spend on the short side or you know the, the hold recommendation side at Redburn and how much of your client coverage was geared up to finding short ideas? Well, it was, I, I guess what was quite interesting was that we were probably more, we had more sell recommendations than most people at the time because, again, it was an independent research firm. But even then, you had a slightly difficult situation where you didn't want to upset companies so there was a balance between wanting to maintain company you know co- coverage of companies and analysts maintain a, a good relationship with those companies for corporate access and other reasons also obviously you know putting out pure research and having a, a clear view and and Redburn definitely started um i mean it, it probably you know in terms of conventional sell side would you know blaze the the trail to some degree and having many more sell recommendations it was always quite quite a challenge and it wasn't the sort of modus operandi of of the firm and indeed you know most sell side research firms you're not going to start out particularly thinking that sell ideas are, are going to make you a huge amount of money because it's just very difficult sort of selling skepticism as we know but also the whole industry is geared around things getting bigger the deals that flow off the back of that growing assets reinvesting those assets etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's sort of counter to the the mindset of of your core clients to some degree if you're a, a sell side institution and and trying to um, come up with with sell ideas because ultimately there are more clients who want buy ideas you know, a lot of people on the sell side um, allude to the, uh, the difficulties of uh, engaging with management. So uh, the lost corporate access, um, you know, as, as people who don't engage with management, um, you know, from our seat, I, I always wonder how I'd react because 
if a short seller would approach me and they were just barking up the wrong tree or there was a misunderstanding in the business, I would have no real issue ask, answering pointing questions. Really interested to understand how how it works when you're in the room with the management teams. If, if they are challenged by the sell side, how you've seen them react and, you know, how that, you know, how that influences the analysts. Yeah, well, back, I mean, remembering back in the day, because we, we tend to do much less um, company interaction now and really focused on on the analyst time on, on doing research. But back in the day, it would always be a slightly frosty reception that one would get if you had a management team in and you had a negative view. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the management team would probably be to some degree trying to swing around the analyst or or, or do their best to to change that view. I mean, usually the, I've, I've found that the best managements don't really talk about the share price at all, mm-hmm. unless obviously things are stupidly st- cheap and they're allocating capital and doing buybacks. But yeah, in my experience, it, it's if I think back to some of the um, the best management teams that I've sat in a room with and, and listened to, it's it tends to be about why they, how they're doing operating the business and the share price is a secondary consideration to some degree. I think it's, you know, certainly throughout this cycle, from my perspective, I think management teams have become increasingly obsessed by the share price. And to a certain extent, I actually think the buy side are, um, are somewhat complicit in that because they're measured by performance of the stock, um, you know, as it speaks to the share price. And I think there's a number of management teams that are seen as really caring about the share price more than the long term of the business. And in many ways, I actually think that is seen as a positive by some people on the buy side. Interested here if you think that has changed or if, you know, that's just a perception from my seat. Yeah, I probably don't have enough contact with with management teams now to to have a sense of that but i would definitely agree that when you talk to investors in the buy side there is a view that well you know if x or y management team are particularly good at talking up their their stock and they you know that's their their modus operandi they're effectively management of the stock instead of management of the company. Whereas that might be a red flag for someone looking into to why that's the case um, from a sort of research perspective. To some degree in this environment, it's been encouragement from 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 a um, you know an investor perspective because you know they'll probably get what they want. I would definitely. I mean, we've seen plenty of examples of that where. You have management teams now who are intensely focused on on share prices, and to some degree, that's probably because they know that you know as valuations get super extended and more and more divorced from the the fundamentals of the company, that you know it increases the the need to do that. So that narrative, I was listening to a very good narrative discussion with Ben Hunt and Grant Williams, I think, on a podcast. And they were talking about how when the narrative of the company or the stock becomes the stock itself that's when you know you have serious you're in sort of serious hyperbolic territory and it it definitely feels that way with a number of, of of companies now